The first time we realized that it was becoming popular was when um, we got a, a complaint from someone who emailed us saying that he'd gone to look at this page and the image was black and he couldn't see the coffee pot. And, and we wondered why this was, because it was working for us. And then we realized he was in Australia. And so it was the middle of the night and none of us were there and he was trying to view the coffee pot in the middle of the night. So we then had to point an angle poise at our coffee machine, an angle poise lamp at our coffee machine, so that uh, people in other time zones could see it when we weren't around drinking coffee. And then we had people turning up at the Cambridge Tourist Information Office asking if they could see the coffee pot, <laughs> which bemused them rather, but they worked out that it was something to do with computers and was probably something therefore to do with the computer lab up the road and so they sent them along and sure enough these people got to you know drink some coffee from the first uh, webcam coffee pot and so on and it it was a it was a really fun story for um, the press to include at the end of otherwise dreary news you know that uh, more than two million people have now viewed this this uh, this little camera which makes it you know East Anglia's top tourist attraction and things like this so coffee pots didn't last very long as uh, you can imagine coffee machines don't get very well treated by by students in general if you imagine about 15 of them <laughs> trying to use one coffee pot they didn't always last very long but um, but the camera itself this this sort of uh, we had I think uh, another camera after a while but generally that worked fairly well and it ran for for about 10 years. We called it the Trojan Room coffee pot because it was in part of the building in the old computer lab called the Trojan Room. And what happened about 10 years after we connected it up was that the lab was going to move here to this nice new building uh, and the Trojan Room was no longer going to exist. And so uh, we thought, well, the Trojan Room coffee pot has had its day, you know, 10 years is a, is a good span and we've, we've made the point and so on. So we'll just turn it off. And this caused an uproar because so many people remembered it fondly. Um, it had been you know, featured on, in major news stuff. Um, uh, people in the UK will know the, uh, the, the long running radio soap opera called The Archers. It had featured on The Archers. Susan's worried by the prospect of people spying on her in The Archers. The point is that word got out. People all over the world started looking at the coffee pot. It was a kind of worldwide joke. It had become really quite popular, and, and it, it was still, though, about the time when big organisations were announcing that they now had a website, and we were announcing that we were just going to turn our website off. And, um, and so uh, this generated a whole load more media interest. I was, I was quoted in one week on the front page of the London Times and the Washington Post <laughs> talking about this. I will never do anything else in my life that has anything like that, even though some of the other things are arguably much more important. People were getting used to this new cyberspace, right? That, that in a way you'd never been able to before, you could click and it would take you to a new place and you could click and it would take you to a new place and you could see this different information really easily, which came from all over the world. And, but they were basically pages of information. And then suddenly you would click through to this page, which had a little window in it, which was a view of the real world again. It was almost the inverse of what we're now doing with augmented reality, right? We were, we were taking a bit of the real world and putting it into cyberspace. And OK, there wasn't anything very interesting happening in that little window, but um, I think there's something deep in our psyche which likes the idea of being able to see things at a distance. You know, we all we, we have so much in our in our literature about crystal balls or seeing stones or um, you know Galadriel's mirror or whatever that lets you lets you see something in a in a place. It's a very powerful concept uh, in a place where you are not. You know, even the magic of a telescope is kind of fun. And this was this was a crazy thing, but you could see inside a room uh, where you'd never been, would probably never go, but you could see what was happening there right now. And um, so I think that was that was kind of an appeal for people. We were just getting into the time when you could make cameras on a single chip. This is a little bit before that, but I started to realize that these were expensive things at the time, but they could become cheap enough and widespread enough that, say, they might actually cost less than a keyboard or a mouse, which was an astonishing idea at the time. But if you can make them with a single chip and you can put a cheap lens in front of them, then cameras could be everywhere, which of course is what happens now. We can get, you know, the cameras in cheap phones anyway are, are you know, cost cents to make. Um, 
almost certainly less than a, than a keyboard or mouse. And so I was really interested in what other things could you do with these plentiful cameras. People were looking at video conferencing, people were looking at um, uh, you know, broadcast quality video. But I wondered, suppose you pointed cameras at other things. Suppose what, what, if computers could know more about what was going on around them, um, you know, whether there was someone sitting in front of them or not. You know, most computers still really don't know that. Um, and, uh, and certainly, you know, what was happening in the corner of the room over there. Um, perhaps we could make more interesting user interfaces. Perhaps we could use cameras as a, as a general sensor for understanding the world around in a way that we never could have done before because they were just too expensive. So what, what connections did it have out of interest? So this is me being super geeky. <laughs> Do you know, I don't actually remember what this had. Oh, this it's has, one of those it, it's a, it looks like an S-Video, but it, it predates that. I think this was probably a special proprietary, proprietary like. thing. Um, some of them, I really don't remember out of here, it, it's proprietary connector. Are you ready for the super geeky question? Mm, Did you have it. to deinterlace it? Do you know, I really don't remember. No, I don't think this was interlaced, but no, it probably would have been actually, because you had to do interlacing on most things to, to you But if you, know, you were throwing away it. a lot of the lines anyway, you probably I think we them. may have been throwing away a lot of the lines, and I think that um, interlacing was used for transmission over, you know, limited bandwidth uh, connections like broadcast. We didn't have to do that here. I don't think we did have to de-interlace this. Um, though we, we probably did have to, uh, you know, to tell it what brightness to be and things like that. I'm not sure that there was very much in the way of auto exposure and things on here. So we first pointed the camera at the coffee pot towards the end of 1991 when the web was just young, uh, but it first was connected to the web in 1993, because that's when the web started to have, um, have the, the capability of displaying images. So it was a networked camera, and other people had done networked cameras. There were various quite cool systems around at the time, uh, particularly based on multicast, um, the M-Bone network, uh, some people may remember, um, where you, uh, you could take a, a rather, rather than multiple viewers connecting to a single camera and all having a, a separate video stream to that camera, which required more video bandwidth than you would typically have, multicast networks let the camera essentially broadcast on a particular address and people who were interested could subscribe to that address and provided all of the network switches between you and the camera understood the concept of multicast, uh, you could then actually share the video fairly efficiently. Um, but that never really took off very widely outside, you know, research environments, I don't think. And um, it's still a good way to do video. But uh, as network bandwidth shot up, um, the, uh, it, you know, it, the, it became plausible to do it I in other ways. One of the, the things, of course, when we switched it um, or enabled it to output this newfangled HTTP protocol, this was, this was still a pretty novel protocol that a lot of people hadn't heard of. But I knew it was going to be interesting. I knew that cameras were going to be interesting because they were starting to get really cheap. But I also thought HTTP was going to be interesting because I'd seen these early web browsers. This was clearly fun. This was clearly a very efficient way of moving through information. And I thought, hmm, this might take off. And at the time, most of the internet backbone in the States was run by the National Science Foundation. And they would publish each month the statistics of how much of each different protocol had been taken over the, over the network. And I remember looking up HTTP on this thing. And I think I, I remember the first time I looked, it was at, ranked at about position 118, I think. So up there, there were the big ones like um, FTP and email and uh, NNTP, UUCP stuff uh, for people who remember those. Um, uh, finger protocol, all of, all of these things that most people don't use or remember now. But um, the next month I looked at it and it had gone up. It had overtaken quite a few. It was at position 90 or something like that. And I started to capture this information once a month and plot a graph of the various protocols. I, I wish I had this data now. I wish I still had my graphs. 
but I could see this HTTP thing. It was like a, a horse that was, you know, at the back of a race uh, that everybody thought, you know, was out of the running, suddenly storming through. And you could see if it continued like this, it was going to overtake things like FTP at some point, which was an amazing concept. Uh, and I suddenly thought, this HTTP, this is actually going to be important. It's capturing the public imagination, and most people have never heard of it, but you can look at the protocols, you can look at the statistics, and you can see where it's going to go. Uh, so that's when I started you know, playing much more seriously with the web. So have you got any pictures of, of when this was active? Well, actually, it's funny. You'd think we would have. Given how many people looked at images of our, of our coffee pot, you'd think that we actually have a good photographic record. Uh, ironically, we don't have that many, partly because taking photos was more of a hassle at that point. We didn't have digital cameras, right, to take photos of our digital camera. Um, this thing only output video. There were a lot of, you know, news broadcasts and so on that had uh, the, the, the broadcasts this stuff. And I've got some old, you know, VHS tapes where, which are, where I captured these news broadcasts. But actually, no, we have almost no photographs, perhaps no photographs at all, of, um, of this in situ pointing at the coffee pot, except what I've captured from video in the same way as we were capturing frames of, from video here when we did the thing. So it's all very, very meta, very circular. But, um, but there is some old news footage, which is quite fun to go back and look at. And you can see me with some more hair and a bit less waist, waistline uh, talking about the importance of, um, of being able to get to our fresh coffee. Yes.